Hello, friends. Thank you so much for watching this recording of our weekly Bible study at St. Timothy. I want to first ask you to please like this video, subscribe. If you're not subscribed to our channel already, please do that so you can get a notification every time that we have a new video or new content available for you. And if you have any questions or reflections throughout the course of this study, please leave those in the comments below for others to see and so that your questions get answered. It's so wonderful to have you join us in this way, but would love to invite you and have you join us in person on Monday nights, every Monday at 7.30 in the Parish Hall at St. Timothy Catholic Church in Laguna Niguel. If you can't join us in person, that's fine, but we would love for you to come. All backgrounds, all levels of faith experience and experience with the Bible are welcome. So we do hope to see you there. And without further ado, enjoy this recording of our weekly Bible study at St. Timothy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for this opportunity to dive into your word. We pray, Lord, that you would allow it to speak to us. In the midst of this Easter season, Lord, just bring us joy. Bring us your peace. Bring us your guidance, and help us to know the truth, the goodness, the beauty, the joy of your resurrection. In all the ways we are seeking and searching, help us to find answers. In the ways we seek comfort, help us to find solace in you. If we are alone, if we are worried, if we are anxious, Lord, come to us in those places as we dive into your word. Speak to each one of us individually and allow us to know you are with us. We ask that you remove any worries or distractions from us. And we pray that you bless each one of us in the ways that we most need it. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome to our Bible study. We are going to be in Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 13. And this is the story of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Thank you for joining us uh, virtually for this. We are in the midst of our parish mission this week, so hopefully you can join us for that. There still may even be time to register. We'd love to have you there. But for those of us here now, in this moment, we're going to read through Luke 24, 13, through 35. We're going to read it twice through. First time through, this is a very common story. You've heard it many times, maybe even seen it depicted in art. I just want to encourage you to look at this and listen to this with fresh eyes. Engage your senses in the text. What do you see? What do you smell? What do you taste, feel, touch? Who are you in the story? What time of day is it? What do you notice? Uh, maybe something you've never noticed before. And pay attention to those things as we read through this the first time through, Luke 24, starting in verse 13. Now that very day, two of them were going to a village seven miles from Jerusalem called Emmaus, and they were conversing about all the things that had occurred. And it happened that while they were conversing and debating, Jesus himself drew near and walked with them, but their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing as you walk alone? They stopped, looking downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, said to him in reply, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know of the things that have taken place there in these days? And he replied to them, What sort of things? They said to him. Sorry, they said to him, The things that happened to Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed, and word before God and all the people. How our chief priests and rulers both handed him over to a sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that he would be the one to redeem Israel. And besides all this, it is now the third day since this took place. Some women from our group, however, have astounded us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. They came back and reported that they had seen a vision of angels and announced, who announced that he was alive. Then some of those with us went to the tomb and found things just as the women had described, but they, but him they did not see. And Jesus said to them, Oh, how foolish you are! How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets spoke! Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them what referred to him in all the scriptures. As they approached the village to which they were going, he gave the impression that he were going on farther. But they urged him, Stay with us, 
for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And it happened that while he was with them at table, he took bread, set the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them. With that, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. But he vanished from their sight. Then they said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he spoke to us on the way and opened the scriptures to us? So they set out at once and returned to Jerusalem, where they found gathered together the eleven and those with them who were saying, The Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon. Then the two recounted what had taken place on the way and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So now that you have an image in your mind of this passage, maybe some key things are starting to stand out to you, you have a sense of it. Now we're going to read through it a second time, and I want you to pay close attention to the words as we read them. What words, phrases, details strike you, stand out to you for whatever reason? Maybe they resonate with you, something you're going through personally. This is not to interpret the text theologically and try and get some secret hidden meaning out of it. It's to interpret it personally. How is God speaking to me? What does this remind me of? What struggles, memories, insights is God putting into my mind in this moment? Pay attention to those things as we read through this one final time. Luke 24, verses 13 to 35. Now that very day, two of them were going to a village seven miles from Jerusalem called Emmaus, and they were conversing about all the things that had occurred. And it happened that while they were conversing and debating, Jesus himself drew near and walked with them, but their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. He asked them, What are you discussing as you walk along? They stopped, looking downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, said to him in reply, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know of the things that have taken place there in these days? And he replied to them, What sort of things? They said to him, The things that happened to Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet mighty indeed and word before God and all the people, how our chief priests and rulers both handed him over to a sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that he would be the one to redeem Israel. And besides all this, it is now the third day since this took place. Some women from our group, however, have astounded us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. They came back and reported that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who announced that he was alive. Then some of those with us went to the tomb and found things just as the women had described, but him they did not see. And Jesus said to them, Oh, how foolish you are! How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets spoke! Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them what referred to him in all the scriptures. As they approached the village to which they were going, he gave the impression that he was going on farther. But they urged him, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And it happened that while he was with them at table, he took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them. With that their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, but he vanished from their sight. Then they said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he spoke to us on the way and opened the scriptures to us? So they set out at once and returned to Jerusalem, where they found gathered together the eleven and those with them who were saying, The Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon. Then the two recounted what had taken place on the way and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So I invite you at this time to uh, pause. Take a moment to reflect on the things that stood out to you. If you're with other people, discuss what stood out to you, why it did, what questions you have about this reading, or you can do that at the end of the video. But if you're with others, you'd like to take a moment to reflect on those things before we dive into this passage and go through it verse by verse, I encourage you to pause the video now and do so. For the rest of us, we are going to continue and go through this verse by verse and see what the Lord is trying to speak to us and to give us a better understanding of what is happening in this passage. So this occurs immediately after Jesus rises from the dead and appears to Mary Magdalene in the garden. So last Sunday, 
we had the, uh, the reading of him appearing to the 11 disciples and to Thomas. Uh, but the Sunday previous, we had the resurrection account on Easter Sunday. And it was the story of Peter and the beloved disciple racing to the tomb and seeing the evidence of the resurrection. Immediately after that, Mary Magdalene comes back because she's hanging around and Jesus appears to her in the garden. And uh, immediately after that is when we have this story of the two disciples going to the road to Emmaus. So when it says, now that very day, this is still Easter day. It's the day of the resurrection. When it says two of them, this is referring to a previous verse in verse 9 where it says, then they returned from the tomb and announced all these things to the eleven and to all the others. So the women, when they find out that Jesus has, when they see Jesus in the garden, when Mary Magdalene sees Jesus in the garden, uh, she returns and reports that to the eleven and to the others that are gathered there. So it's, a, it's apparent from the context that these two people were part of the others. They have heard the reports of Jesus being risen from the dead. They are faithful disciples, people who have followed Jesus. But they are going to a village seven miles from Jerusalem called Emmaus. Jerusalem is the focal point. It's the place Jesus was trying to get to to fulfill his mission. It's the place of action, the place he says to the apostles, do not leave Jerusalem before I give you my spirit and so you can go be my witnesses. He hasn't said that yet, but he will. So this is the focal point. And these two disciples, they're going the wrong way. And it's very likely that they're returning home. They live nearby. They were in town for the pilgrimage feast of Passover, making their sacrifices, which they're, uh, they're required to do. At least all men above a certain age are required to do every year within a certain radius of the city. And so they're going home. But who are these two people? We know the name of one of them in verse 18 is Cleopas. Now, most biblical scholars align Cleopas with Clopas. It's a, just a different spelling. And Clopas is often referenced in the Gospels as the husband of one of the women who was following Jesus, Mary, wife of Clopas. And there's one key passage in John 19, 25, where it's uh, in the events of the, the resurrection, it talks about the women who are standing there. It says, standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas and Mary of Magdala. So Mary, this other Mary, the problem is also at this time, everybody's named Mary. So everyone's got nicknames or they're attached to a person or a place or something like that. So Mary, the wife of Clopas, is the sister of the Blessed Mother. And so it's believed that uh, their sisters through marriage, that Clopas or Cleopas is actually the brother of St. Joseph. And so these two disciples that are going on their way to Emmaus are not just any two disciples, but because the other one is not mentioned, it's likely a woman, it's likely a married couple. And so this is likely Jesus' aunt and uncle leaving, going back home, turning away from all of this hopefulness, all that they knew about Jesus, being so intimately close to him as family. And not only that, other scholars, so we get this from many different people. This is, uh, so Papias of Hierapolis is a church father uh, and writer uh, from the year 70 to uh, 130 AD. And he writes that Cleopas or Clopas and Alpheus are the same person. Alpheus is the father of James the Lesser, potentially also of Thaddeus. So two apostles, the father of Simeon, who eventually takes over uh, as the leader of the church in Jerusalem, and another son named Joseph, named for his brother. And so Alpheus is Clopas, this man who's on the road to Emmaus, this married couple, they are potentially the parents of two of the apostles. And another son will eventually be the leader of the church in Jerusalem. This is incredible. These aren't just two any people. Scholars and church fathers report that this is who these people are, and it continues. Eusebius of Caesarea, he writes this in, in 180 AD, that he interviewed the grandsons of Thaddeus. And they said that Simeon, the son of Clopas, he would occupy the seat in Jerusalem because he was found worthy to do so because of his closeness, his family ties to Jesus. And then later at the end of the third century, Epiphanius, another uh, writer, says that Joseph and Cleopas were brothers. They were both sons of Jacob, surnamed Panther. And I had to say that because how cool is it that potentially Joseph's father's surname was Panther? I mean, it brings a whole new meaning to like Wakanda forever, you know, like long live the Panther and the family of the Panther. How cool would it be if St. Joseph's last name was Panther? Like, that's just so awesome. So anyways, 
That's what the church fathers say about this person. And he's a person in church history. He's a saint in the church. He has a feast day in the Eastern Church and in the Catholic, in the, the Western Latin Catholic Rite. And so this is a very influential individual. He didn't just disappear. He wasn't just anybody. This was the, a married couple who was intimately tied to the ministry of Jesus. And yet, they're leaving Jerusalem and they're going home. It's as if they're giving up. They're going the wrong way. Now, does that mean they didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah? No. They say later on that they're distraught because they thought he would be the one to redeem Israel. But they're leaving because they had different expectations. They looked at Jesus and they saw their version of Jesus and they refused to see anything else. Do you do that? I think we all do that sometimes. We have our own view of Jesus, our own view of church, our own view of the type of people that he likes. And it's very uh, not ironic, I guess, that Jesus always happens to hate the same people that we hate, right? Um, and in reality, Jesus hates no one. But that's an example for all of the ways that we try and justify our image of Jesus. Or different images of Jesus might be hard for us to grasp. And so sometimes we end up wandering off in a different direction. Some scholars estimate that Emmaus was about 7 to 11 miles west of Jerusalem. Uh, nobody really knows its location. But west is the direction opposite of the sunrise. You know, churches are meant to face east. In a lot of religious traditions, you face east because that is the holy land. That is the place where the sun rises, where God greets us, where Jesus, the literal sun, is represented on the day of the resurrection and every day. And so they're going in the exact wrong direction geographically and also spiritually. They're not sticking around. And yet, when they're questioned by this person they do not recognize, they don't shy away from the message of Jesus despite the horrific death that he just endured and them potentially suffering the same fate if they're continuing to spread the news about Jesus being the Messiah. They're willing to bravely share. So it shows there's still a deep connection and belief, but there's also a disconnect. There's this despair that their beliefs did not bear out. Their plans, their idea of who Jesus was did not come to fruition. And because of that, they leave. I mean, what a, what a powerful reflection for us to think about how that has been true or can be true in our own lives. How easy it is for us to cut ties, to question God or blame God when things do not go exactly the way that we want. When people confront us with a different image of Jesus that's uncomfortable, is it easy for us to reject it? Is it tempting for us to say no to certain church events or certain ministries because that's just not for me? Well, is God not for you? Is God not present in these people and these things that are happening? We need to widen our perspective of who Jesus is or we might miss him even if he's standing right in front of us. So that is one of the main lessons of this road to Emmaus. These people so intimately close to Jesus, potentially his family, and familial connections to other apostles, and yet still so easy to misconstrue what's going on and to turn away and to walk home. And they may be going home because they don't know what else to do. They want to go somewhere comfortable. They want to rest. And we can get that way in our faith too. Oh, I'm challenged. I don't know if I want to say yes to that. It's easier for me just to say home or just keep coming to Mass and not getting involved in anything else. That's comfortable for me. No. The story of the road to Emmaus challenges us to ask ourselves, am I really being a disciple of Jesus? Am I going in the right direction? Or am I just going to what's comfortable, to what's home, to my image of Jesus? And when that doesn't come to fruition, do I allow my disappointment to, to start me down a path that is not going to ultimately lead to intimate relationship with the Lord? The word Emmaus for, uh, you know, the name of the city. We don't know where it is, which kind of makes it almost this mystical representation of, of a spiritual place. It actually means hot spring or spring of salvation. So recognize these people, they're going away from the source of salvation, Jesus, who said he would come back crucified from the dead and raised from the dead after three days. They're leaving that true source of salvation, and they're looking for some other source of salvation. They're going to some other spring, something that, just like the woman at the well, is coming for water. And Jesus says, I will give you living water. And she, says, she thinks it's a, a spring. She's like, tell me where this water is. She's looking for an earthly satisfaction to her desires instead of seeing the salvation that is right in front of her. They are conversing about all the things that have occurred. And while they're walking, conversing and debating, another clue that it's a married couple, uh, Jesus himself drew near and walked with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. 
Is it because they're so hard hearted they can't see their own nephew, their own family member, or the person, the teacher that they followed faithfully as a disciple? No, the verb here is a passive verb, which means that this is something that happened to them. God prevented them from recognizing Jesus for a greater purpose, so that this journey of accompaniment would be revealed who Jesus was in its fruition in the breaking of the bread, which is such a beautiful model, not only for evangelization, but also for the Mass. And we'll talk about both of those. So he continues, we continue. Uh, he asks them, what are you discussing? They stop looking downcast. They're obviously very upset by what has happened. They're not, you know, uh, um, thinking that Jesus wasn't the Messiah. And they're downcast that potentially this was their family member as well. So bravely, they share, one of them named Cleopas, we've talked about who he might be. His name, by the way, Cleopas, means vision of glory. This is someone who has seen the glory of God manifest in Jesus, potentially seen him from a very young age grow up and reveal himself to be the Messiah that is promised. And they believed it. They believed he'd be the one to redeem Israel. They've seen the vision of glory, and yet they're abandoning that vision and going back off in the wrong direction. Are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know of the things that have taken place? They know this is like, this is the news. This is the, the biggest thing that, that, is, that is happening. And yet, they still are walking away. And he replies, what sort of things? Now, this is where Jesus shows us a brilliant model for evangelization. He starts by asking a question. What are you discussing as you walk along? You know, there's so many times I've been in public or I've been in a workplace when I wasn't working for a church or people bring up things that are, you know, antithetical to my Christian values, or they're offensive, or they're blatantly crude or crass. And I sometimes am tempted to just tell them off, or be like, oh no, Catholics aren't like that. Don't defame the church. Don't take the Lord's name in vain, and just correct, correct, teach, teach. And instead, sometimes the best thing to do is just ask, oh, what are you guys talking about? Or if someone is curious about the faith, curious about God, or maybe they have some reservations, like, well, tell me what your experience has been. Who do you think God is? Tell me about this God you don't believe in. Great question for atheists. Because they often don't believe. It's not that they lack a belief in the real God. They lack a belief in some version of God that they've absorbed or that they were taught. That's not the true God when they were young or in some time of suffering in their life. And so he leads with a question. And then he asks them to explain, you know, what sort of things had happened? What sort of things have happened in Jerusalem? And they go on and they say, the things that happened to Jesus the Nazarene. Don't address him as Messiah or Savior or Son of God. They call him by a very human designation, where he's from. And they only call him a prophet, mighty indeed in word before God and all the people. And then they reveal that he was sentenced to death. He was handed over and crucified. They don't reveal that he promised that he would rise from the dead. They've somehow forgotten that detail. But it says they were hoping that he would be the one to redeem Israel. And besides all this, it's now the third day since this took place. So beyond that, he's not only dead, he's really dead. And there's no hope for us. It's been three days. You know, uh, our hope, our despair, our hopelessness and despair are kind of sinking in. Now recognize here, they see something very important. We were hoping that he would be the one to redeem Israel. Now, what they mean is, we were hoping he would be the one to redeem us from Roman oppression and reinstate the Davidic kingdom that was promised to come back when the Messiah would come, the new king in the line of David. And many, many people had interpreted that to mean the Messiah would be a political ruler, a revolutionary, who would overthrow all these oppressive powers and reinstate this glorious king, kingdom of David, to where the presence of God filled the temple again, and all was well. And so that's what they mean. But what did Jesus really do? He redeemed Israel, but he didn't overthrow the oppression of the Romans. He overthrew the oppression of sin. And that really was the more profound and more heroic thing to do. Is the Roman Empire still oppressing people today? No, it's gone. Is sin? Absolutely. Jesus knew what he was doing. But when our focus is too narrow, we can sometimes mix, miss the bigger picture of God's plan in our lives, in the lives of the church, and in the world. Some women from our group, however, they've astounded us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, did not find his body, came back, and it says this, they'd seen a vision of angels who announced that he was alive. 
see that note that word there a vision it's almost as if they're saying like they saw something but it was it was it wasn't the full uh sense of reality it was a vision it wasn't actually angels it was a vision of angels then some of those with us went to the tomb and found things just as the women had them had described but him they did not see so that they go back they find the tomb empty so even that is not enough to convince them something is going on and they still return home. I talked about this last week in Bible study, but sometimes we have to ask ourselves a question like, what would be enough? Or ask others, what would be enough to convince you? Because sometimes even when you have the evidence right in front of you, you cannot see it. This is kind of like, you know, when you're, when you're looking at a puzzle or what's a good analogy? Like if someone tells you a pun and you just don't get it, you know, so uh, a pun is, you know, or a joke that uses a pun is like, uh, why did the blind man walk into the well? Because he did not see that well. And you might look at the words of that pun and say, well, yeah, obviously he didn't see that. He didn't see the well. That's why he fell in. You know, and you might, you might not get it. And yet after looking at it, no new words need to appear. Nothing new needs to be explained to you. You look at the evidence again and you, and you, you get it. You recognize, oh, it's a play on words that he also couldn't see that well. And that's why he fell in. It's the same thing is true with the evidence of the resurrection. All the evidence could be laid bare and you could be in denial and denial until you realize, wait a minute, why would robbers roll that linen up? Wouldn't they take it to the body because it was stuck to the body? Why would the stone be rolled away when there was a, a, a Roman guard and seal placed upon the stone? That would mean they'd be punished by death if they broke that, that seal. And if anyone touched a body... They'd be impure and, and defiled and unclean and not able to go into the temple. Why did these things happen? And if we were making this up, why would we report that the first witness was a woman? Because a woman's eyewitness testimony is not reliable in a court of law or accepted at this time. And so none of these things make any sense until you admit that they point to the truth of the resurrection. That same evidence can be laid before you, but until you take the time to look at it and see what it really means, you might not initially get it. And it seems that's what's happening to them. And then in verse 25, Jesus says to them, Oh, how foolish you are. How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets spoke. Was it not necessary, that word there used in Greek is dei, that, that he must, the Messiah must suffer. It was imperative for him to suffer for us. Luke is explicit about this, but the Old Testament belief that the Messiah should, su should suffer was not something most people were aware of or expecting. Most people weren't expecting a suffering Messiah. Even though there's text in, uh, of that in the Old Testament, people were relying more so on that political ruler. That's what they wanted because of the cultural reality at the time. Some even expected that there'd be two Messiahs, one who was a priestly kind of Messiah and one who was the kingly Messiah. And it wasn't until both of them came that the, you know, the full fruition of the kingdom of God and the reestablishment and redemption of Israel would take place. Now, what they didn't realize is the priestly figure of the tribe of Levi and the kingly figure in the tribe of Judah and the line of David both are Jesus. And Jesus traces his lineage to both of those people through either of his parents. And so it's important to recognize that this is indeed something that Jesus fulfills, but it wasn't explicitly expected by people when they talked about the Messiah at this time. It was a little more expected that someone more prophetic, a more prophetic Messiah, uh, would come by the Samaritans. They actually had that belief. And it traces back when it says here, Moses then starts, or Jesus then starts with Moses and all the prophets and interprets them what refers to him. Going all the way back to Moses, it's one of these first prophecies in Moses, in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, Moses says, A prophet like me will the Lord your God raise up for you from among your own kindred kindred, that is the one to whom you shall listen. Moses himself promises that a prophet will come who is like him. And of course, Jesus far surpasses him, but Jesus does a lot of things to show that he is a new Moses. He climbs a mount and gives a sermon on the mount, a new law, just like Moses did. He leads people out of sin through baptism. He allows himself to be baptized as a metaphorical passing through the waters uh, to escape the slavery of sin, even though he himself had not sinned and did not need baptism. 
He did it as an example for us. He's out tempted in the desert for 40 days, just like the people were mumbling and grumbling in the desert for 40 years. He shows all of these ways that he is like Moses. And then he continues to reveal in other places. In Psalm 22, the psalm where it says, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? All these places where uh, Jesus' reference and his suffering are prophesied. All who see me mock me. They curl their lips and jeer. They shake their heads at me. Um, Like water, my life drains away. All my bones are disjointed. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They stare at me and gloat. They divide my garments among them. For my clothing, they cast lots. All of which prophesied the events of the crucifixion of Jesus in Psalm 22. In Isaiah, there are four songs of a suffering servant. One of the most profound is in Isaiah 53, the fourth one, starting verse 4. It was our pain that he bore, our sufferings he endured. We thought of him as stricken, struck down by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our sins, crushed for our iniquity. He bore the punishment that makes us whole. By his wounds, we are healed. And it continues on and on with further details, like a lamb led to slaughter where sheep silent before shearers. He did not open his mouth, just like Jesus was silent when questioned. All these different details that prophesy the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. And two more from the prophets, one from the prophet Hosea, chapter 6, verse 2. He will revive us after two days. On the third day, he will raise us up to live in his presence. And then in Amos, Chapter 9, verse 11. On that day, I will raise up the fallen hut of David. I will wall up its branches, breaches, raise up its ruins, and rebuild it as in the days of old. All of these things and many others pointing to the ways that the Old Testament scriptures prophesied all that would happen to Jesus, that the Messiah must suffer for our sins. So as they approach the village, Jesus gives the impression he's going on further. This is the next clue of evangelization. So he asks questions. He asks them to clarify. He corrects and teaches where necessary. And then he does not force or impose himself on them. He waits for them to want more. He piques their curiosity. So he doesn't speak in a derisive way. He doesn't speak in a way that's condemning or judgmental. It invites further conversation. And then he goes when he, was, he is invited. And so the message for us would be to bring others to Jesus, to keep that door open for future conversation, to not feel like we have to establish all the answers to all the questions and get them to convert right there on the spot, but always leave the door open and invite them to encounter Jesus. Where? In the breaking of the bread, at the Mass, in being part of the community. And so, stay with us, for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. This is a key verse here where it indicates this is probably where they lived. And this is a very uh, common thing at this time. It was expected that you would extend hospitality to the stranger because there was an expectation that you would encounter God in the stranger. In fact, this is very reminiscent of the three angelic uh, witnesses or strangers that appear to Abraham and Sarah at the uh, Oak of Mamre in Genesis chapter 18. Uh, Abraham sees, it says, see if I can find it. It says, the Lord appeared to Abraham by the oak of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent while the day was growing hot. Looking up, he saw three men standing near him. So notice that. It says, the Lord appeared. How did the Lord appear? As three men. Father, Son, Holy Spirit? I don't know. Maybe pretty Old Testament reference to something that is a doctrine of the church. But anyway, they appear and they share a meal together and they reveal to Abraham and Sarah that despite their old age and Sarah being infertile, she will give birth to a child. And so despite the fact that they cannot see a way out of their situation, God comes to them. They are prevented from seeing his true nature. He reveals to them something that allows them to have fruitful faith that will go on and bless others. That's exactly what happens here. And the fact that it's a married couple, it's like a a redeemed version of Adam and Eve or of Abraham and Sarah, of a couple who is led astray and is being brought back into a place of fruitfulness. So Jesus goes in, he accepts his hospitality. Again, this was normal at this time uh, to extend hospitality, an expectation you would encounter God in the stranger. And it happened that while he was at table with them, he took bread. Now this was a thing that the hosts would normally do. So Jesus here is asserting his identity and trying to make something obvious to them. And then the language that's used here is the language of the Last Supper. It's the language of the Mass. He took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them. 
That's exactly what we say at every Mass. That's exactly what happened in the Last Supper in Matthew 26, 26. And in that moment, with that, their eyes were opened and they recognized him, but he vanished from their sight. Were not our hearts burning within us while he spoke to us on the way and opened the scriptures to us? So they set out at once to go seven miles back to Jerusalem. They are sent to go and witness what had happened. What a beautiful image of the Mass. This is the Mass. We are wandering in whatever direction in our ways of life, and we come and we encounter Jesus. And what happens first when we come to Mass? The liturgy of the Word. We are revealed the teachings about Jesus and hearing the readings and hearing the homily. And in that way, Jesus is present to us, albeit spiritually, but he's present to us. And that leads us into the liturgy of the Eucharist when we celebrate the sacrifice of the Mass and we actually receive Jesus, body, blood, soul, and divinity present under the accidents of bread and wine. And in that, he is revealed to us. And yet, once we think we have a grasp of him, once we think we recognize him, once we think we know him, that vanishes before our sight too because we cannot fully comprehend or understand God. His mission there had been fulfilled. He was needed elsewhere. And what happens at the end of Mass? The word Mass itself comes from the very last phrase of the Mass in Latin. Ita misa est. Go forth, you are sent. That's what it means to go to Mass, is to be sent. And what do they do? They are sent by their own burning desires being fulfilled and hearing the ministry of Jesus and the words of Jesus, recognizing him in the breaking of the bread. They send themselves back to Jerusalem to witness to the rest of the disciples what it is that they have seen. This is a beautiful image for the Mass, for evangelization, for sharing the good news, but also a reminder to us that sometimes Jesus can be right in front of us. We think we know him, and yet we cannot recognize him. Even those who are closest to Jesus struggled with this. So how do we encounter him? In the breaking of the bread and in, com in, in conversations with him, in the scriptures. When we go to Mass, when we encounter him in the sacraments, when we open the word and we spend time with him in prayer. If you feel like God is distant, you can't hear his voice, you don't know what he's doing in your life. One of those three things, if not all of them, are probably lacking in your prayer life. Are you praying to God daily in a conversational way? Or are you dominating the conversation? Are you listening? Are you allowing God to speak to you and reveal truth to you? Are you learning his teachings by diving into the word every day? And are you faithfully approaching God in the sacraments? Not in a state of sin, not in a state of obligation but in a state of expected faith and opportunity, that this is an opportunity for me to come and worship a God who has given everything for me, who died on the cross for me, who rose from the dead for me. And when we do those three things consistently and faithful, faithfully with the right disposition of heart, God becomes present to us. He will not seem absent. We will not be in a place of desolation or a dark night of the soul forever when we do those things faithfully, day in and day out, week in and week out. So this week's gospel is an invitation for you and I to assess, are those things true in my own life? And then to ask, does this look like my experience at Mass? Is Jesus revealed to me? Am I that attentive to where my heart is burning with desire to know more when I'm at Mass? And lastly, who are the people on the road to Emmaus in my life who I need to go and be Jesus to, who I need to witness to in the midst of this Easter season? And that witness should be one of joy because we are an Easter people and hallelujah is our song. The resurrection is real and if the resurrection is real, it changes everything. And that should bring us immense joy, joy that we cannot contain and we must share with others. And so I pray that you will do that this week. You will encounter God in the sacraments and prayer and scripture and that you will be able to enter into the mass in a new way so that you encounter God in a way where the burning desires of your hearts are being inflamed and they're being fulfilled by the God who loves you and sustains you in the Eucharist. That is all I have for you. God bless you and let us end in prayer. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you, Jesus, for this opportunity to dive into your word. Bless all those watching now, all those watching in the future, wherever they are, whatever time it is, however soon after this is published or years later, that they would be blessed immensely at the hearing of this word, and they would be encouraged to know that they can encounter you. They have access to you each and every day. But we pray, God, that you would help us to examine the ways that we have narrowed our expectations or our ideas of who you are, because those can limit us and prevent us from seeing you and how you are seeking to be present to us in our daily lives. 
So help us to see you with fresh eyes, to expand our view of who you are and what you're desiring for each of us. And help us to ask, who in our lives do we need to go witness to? Bless us each in the ways we most need it until we gather again. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.